thank you all for coming out tonight, especially with the weather. <laughs> it's, so this is a very impressive turnout. I'm surprised that you know everyone is, is here and very glad that everyone decided to come. It's wonderful to see so many people that are interested in the topic of immigration and the Catholic Church's response to um, serving newcomers in our diocese and, uh, and also in um, behind the scenes working with lawmakers and helping affect policy change. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to introduce Father Edlickson, the pastor at St. Agnes, and he will start us off tonight with a brief prayer. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we recall the words of your Son, Jesus, who says, Seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, and all the blessings we need shall be granted. We turn to you, Heavenly Father, with this uh, disposition of hope and love that we may always serve our brothers and sisters in a way that gives life, that they may have it to the full. We ask this to you, Heavenly Father, in those words that your Son and our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, welcome to St. Agnes, everybody. We're glad that you came here this evening. And uh, so just a, a, a brief uh, overview here. I'm going to give a broad uh, overview of Catholic social teaching as best I can in the next 15 minutes. So uh, you get, you're going to get three hours credit for a 15-minute uh, <laughs> talk here. And then after that, of course, we have Ashley Feasley, Jeff Caruso, and, and, and Greg McKinney. Ashley from the USCCB, Jeff from the Virginia Catholic Conference, and um, Greg from uh, the Migration Refugee Services. So we'll, we'll find out this, we'll, we'll discuss this issue from various angles and perspectives of the church and our faith. So anyway, I'm going to dive right into Catholic social teaching. And I'm going to start off with this point. Man, or the human race, the humanity, the human person, is the reason why God became man in Jesus. And the human person is the one creature, the one creature who can most perfectly give glory to God. And thereby, in order to restore that dignity and that vocation to the human race, God became man. The Son of God became one of us. And that is the starting point of everything we believe as Catholics and how we approach all of our brothers and sisters, especially for those who suffer, that are weak and are vulnerable. And so this leads to a point that is, I might call, a, a pre-teaching or something that pre, is presumed in Catholic social teaching. When we say social, we're presuming, how, we're talking about how the church approaches society, how we relate to one another socially. But there's something basic in this that we must return to, and that is what we call the dignity of the human person, which in a very deep and fundamental way is related to what we call the right to life. The right to life is not only a moral principle, but it is also, in terms of our society, which includes the state, a legal obligation to be protected and administered by law. This is a fundamental duty that a society and its governance cannot abrogate and should not abrogate to protect, even by law, the right to life of an innocent person. And this is most markedly the case when any innocence is involved. And that includes not only an unborn child, but anyone else in between, and also the dying. However, the principle of human dignity and the right to life is more than just avoiding homicide. And that sounds rather sharp, but it's, it's true. And it's more than just proposing laws against homicide, which are essential. I'm not in any ways minimizing this. But we have to look at the whole picture, not the either or, but the both and. So life is something that we must, in one sense, give over and over again. Yes, life begins at conception, or in scientific terms, fertilization. Yes, and then entry into this world begins with birth. That's what we often refer to as the right to life. But life is more than giving birth. 
Life is something we give again and again and again. And that is the gospel. Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it to the full. So life is a process for every one of us, and we constantly have to seek it and constantly have to give it. And that is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's why and we treat the vulnerable, even after they're born, in a way that is more than simply what we often speak of and we lead into the hair-splitting questions of right and wrong or prudential decisions. How we treat a vulnerable person, even after they're born, is more than what we call a prudential decision. A strictly or more strictly prudential decision on a society or a governmental level might be, should we pave the road or not pave the road? Should the Federal Reserve increase the interest rate or lower the interest rate? Should we raise the tax or lower the tax? Should we do this or do that? These are more strictly what we call prudential decisions. They're based upon the virtue of prudence. It's simply, we're just you know, making good judgment in terms of the nuts and bolts of administering a society. However, when we get to questions that determine the, 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 the livelihoods and the life of vulnerable people, and that includes immigrants, and it also includes a lot of other people, this is more than prudential. Yes, there are prudential decisions that come into play. How do we handle the situation, the immigration situation, the poverty situation, or this, that, or the other? That's all part of it. However, it's more than that. Why? Because the lives of those who suffer or those who are seeking life are at stake. And that is to be looked upon not only in terms of a moral issue, but even down on the level of our own humanity, on the level of empathy. To have empathy for those who suffer. And I say this because I don't want, because we have to get beyond sometimes the hair splitting distinctions that we have, which can be very helpful in our moral theology, Catholic teaching. But we have to look beyond that into the bold proclamation of what Jesus Christ commanded us to do by virtue of our baptism. So therefore, I want to bring out a key distinction in Catholic social teaching that is often overlooked. It's kind of, it's baked into it, but it's often not always understood. That is, Catholic social teaching makes a distinction between development and progress. Progress you know, can, be, is, can be good, it can be evil, and it can be indifferent. We can say the chemical weapon is progress, technical progress. What I can also say that medical advances that help us give us a better life and improve our health are also progress. But in the, in the, in the nuts and bolts of progress, that, that is more strictly prudential. It's a prudential decision, or it's prudential in you know, what makes a better medicine or what makes, what's a better medicine than another, or what's better medical treatment than another, or a better way to administer a project than another. But development is not strictly prudential. It is, a, it is a matter of ethics as well. It plays into it. And so therefore, in Catholic social teaching, the development of the human person is the essential end and purpose of that doctrine. It's what we seek. And I might add, the development of the human person is no different from the mission of Jesus Christ. Christ came to restore us, to forgive our sins, and to give us life through the forgiveness of sins and give us grace, the life of the Holy Spirit. And likewise, society on its level is there to give us all, of, all that we need to grow even on the natural level as human beings. So the life of grace that is given to us by the church and the life of our natural development as humans, which is given to us by society, which includes the state, this is the end of human endeavor, both natural and supernatural. I want to read to you a quote right from the Compendium of the Church's Social Doctrine, which is basically the Catechism of Social Catholic Teaching. It says this, A just society can become a reality only when it is based on the respect of the transcendent dignity of the human person. Hear this line. The person represents the ultimate end of society. 
The person is the ultimate end of society. It's also the ultimate end of Christ, by which it is ordered to the person. Hence, the social order and its development must invariably work to the benefit of the human person, since the order of things is to be subordinate to the order of persons, and not the other way around. Respect for human dignity can in no way be separated from obedience to this principle. It is necessary to consider every neighbor without exception as another self, taking into account first of all his life and the means necessary for living it with dignity. Notice, account for his life, the right to life, and the means to live that life to which he has a right with dignity. Every political, economic, social, scientific, and cultural program must be inspired by the awareness of the primacy of each person, person, each human person over society. That right there is worth a lot of reflection. That that paragraph alone sums the whole thing up. It's worth a meditation reflection. So the dignity of the human person and his or her development leads to the key principles that define Catholic social teaching. So I've just given you the basis of the whole thing. Okay, I'm going to try to go through it. You know, the key principles. First one, the common good. This is the principle. This is the principle that serves human development. The recent popes, most notably Benedict and Francis, and also uh, Pope John Paul II and prior, they have at times spoke of the, the human dignity or the dignity of the human person. And the common good, the most basic principle of Catholic social teaching, they speak of it in terms of what they call human ecology, the environment of the ecology in which we are, we can thrive. So the common good is the ecology. It is the atmosphere in which the human being can flourish. And this is what must be promoted by our culture, our social attitudes, and even our state. So the common good, I'm going to, define, I'm going to give you the academic definition right here, right out of the compendium of social doctrine. The common good is the sum total of social conditions which allow people, either as groups or as individuals, to reach their fulfillment more fully and more easily. And that is a beautiful summary of what a society ought to do. So the principle of a common good is the basis for cultivating this human ecology, this atmosphere, that enables the human being to become what he is. So that's a line from St. Augustine. Oh man, become what you are. Note that the, that definition of the common good sees individuals and groups working together in almost like an organic humanity for the good of everyone. This is about the restoration, not only of human interaction, but it's about the restoration of all of creation. Catholic, so that's what we have to look at. We can't look at it as just simply in matters of, you know, you know, where do you draw the line? How much can we get away with? Or how much are we obliged to do? I mean, that can be helpful when you, sometimes when you get down to some really tough questions, but by and large, that is not how we need to be approaching the questions of, uh, that involve human beings. We need to know how much, can, how much are we obliged to do, but how much can we do, or ought we to do, for the development of that person or even that group of people. So the common good is, 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 is part of another, something you might call another principle that's kind of baked into it. It's, a, it's called the universal destination of goods. You know, when I was at the campus ministry and I was talking to, this, to the college kids, some girls said, well, is that communism? No, it's not communism. Believe me, this has absolutely nothing to do with it. Okay, the universal destination of goods. It means this. God destined the earth and all it contains for all men and all people so that all created beings or things would be shared fairly by all mankind under the guidance of justice tempered by charity. In other words, it's almost, think about it. God made this world, and this world was... was put here for the development of the human person and human society. That's Genesis, the first three chapters, first two chapters. So, and it's also what Christ came to restore. So another key principle, I just talked about common good, is, and baked into that is the universal destination of goods. The other one's called subsidiarity. And that basically means, it means that a group or power at a higher level should not take over what a lower level can do better or ought to be doing freely without too much interference. And so in other words, for example, you know, the feds shouldn't do what the state can do better, and the state shouldn't do what the local government can do better, and the government shouldn't do what the family can do better. So in other words, give people the freedom to operate at their local level. So in other words, you might say it's a form of localism. 
And this is, this is baked into that as another principle we call participation. It's basically, we often think of that in terms of democracy. When I say democracy, I don't necessarily mean a system of government. I mean, we participate and all have a right to contribute to the common good. This is what subsidiarity means. Freely, we are free to use our God-given gifts and talents and uniqueness, not only as individuals, but as societies and groups in our own culture and that culture, have a right to contribute to the betterment of the big picture. Freely, without micromanagement. That's the summary of it. And this is what we call subsidiarity, and it promotes participation, which is another word for, in a certain sense, democracy. It doesn't, I know when I say democracy, I don't mean voting and all that. I mean particip full participation in the life of our society. So thou shalt, thou shalt not micromanage is the key. However, that does not mean, uh, you know, that does not mean necessarily mean provincialism or local yokelism. It doesn't mean, okay, stay out of my life. I have no, my little town is my little town and I have no obligations to, to everybody else. Stay out of my life. That's not what it means. Subsidiarity, you know, freedom at the local level, is it also has to work in harmony with solidarity, which means there are some principles that transcend local rights. And I think this country has had its own battles with that. For example, in the civil rights movement. You know, people would often argue, well, I have a right to exclude this racial group from my business uh, because, and that's my right, and, and, and no, the feds don't have a right to come in and, 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 and dictate what I do. But no, the feds came in and said, no, there are some rights that transcend your right to your local business. You know, and so, and, and there's, so this is a case of a tension between extreme subsidiarity over and against a, a legitimate solidarity. We saw a lot of that going on in the, in the 50s and the 60s. And perhaps we still have some of that resonating with us today. But anyway, so solidarity also is, is something that uh, is another a point that's baked into that is what we call the preferential option for the poor. So in other words, you know, my local yokel interests should never be the cause or, justifi or justification for violating the rights of a vulnerable or a poor person. So anyway, there you go. That is the best I can do in 15 minutes to give you Catholic social teaching. You can take three semesters or four semesters of this stuff at Catholic U. You just heard it in 15 minutes. So here, the common good, okay, the common good is sum total of all conditions that help human development, and that ties into the universal destination of goods, the earth, and all it provides is for the common good. Subsidiarity, that means everybody has a right to participate without micromanagement or somebody interfering. They have a right to freedom to participate and contribute to society. But solidarity protects the rights of everyone across the board, and this is where we get the preferential option for the poor. So anyway, you can see how this plays into a lot of issues, but also in the immigration issue itself, which gets rather complex. So this evening, I ask us to, to cleanse the partisan palette. Uh, that means it, it, it's, we, we, I want to look at it from a strictly Christian point of view. Let's pretend we don't know about all the partisan disputes, left and right, and this, that, and the other. Just pretend that. Let's try a thought experiment. Let's look at it strictly from the vantage point of Jesus Christ. In other words, whose only purpose in life was the development of the human, to forgive sins, and so that the human person could become what they were meant to be. Thank you. I'm Brooke Hammond Perez. I'm the Director of Newcomer Services with Catholic Charities of Arlington. I work uh, with Gregory here, who you guys will hear from later. I also wanted to mention that there are index cards at that table. If you didn't pick any up and you want to get up um, and get some, please, if you have any questions for the um, panelists tonight, please uh, write down um, your questions on the index card. And once all four panelists have finished speaking, um, we will um, be able to respond to as many um, questions as possible, time permitting. And without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Ashley Feasley, who is the Director of Policy at the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishop. Um, thank you very much for having me here uh, tonight and for coming in the rain. Um, my name is Ashley, and I work at the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops in the Migration and Refugee Services Office. Um, a lot of people don't know, but the Migration and Refugee Services Office is the largest office within the Bishops' Conference, and it's the only direct service component. Um, we provide services for uh, refugees 
unaccompanied children, and then human trafficking victims. And we do it through our Catholic Charities Network, um, including Arlington, who's a proud partner with us. Um, it is through this work, uh, as well as the Catholic social doctrine and principles on migration, that we work on policy positions with the federal government. Um, we work with mostly Congress and the administration in furthering those policies. And the policies, again, reflect um, care and concern for the populations that we provide direct service for throughout the country, and also representing the bishop's migration issues. So Father did a wonderful job talking about the Catholic social teaching and principles of the larger picture. I'm going to drill down real quick to talk about some of our migration principles, uh, which kind of uh, frame our work every day. But very quickly before I do that, um, I'm going to ask everyone, who here knows about the Justice for Immigrants Coalition? Oh, I have my work cut out for me here. So the Justice for Immigrants Coalition is the Bishop's public education and advocacy campaign. It's the first of its kind. It was introduced in 2003. Um, it's involved in every, almost every um, diocese and many parishes around the country. We have about um, a mailing list of about 85,000 people and active membership, I would say, of about 3,000 people around the country who go to meetings, participate in things on, on really a weekly basis. I really urge you to um, hop on the JFI website. It's www.justiceforimmigrants.org. Um, we provide materials on a regular basis. We do national calls and we do webinars. Um, and it's a range of materials on migration. It may not be a policy issue. We're doing a series on Catholic social teaching and migration. Uh, we've done some things about community engagement, uh, welcoming immigrants and refugees. And um, you know, it is a helpful place to find information about uh, what we do in this area. And there are some great stories that we actually have about uh, people who have been served through the Catholic network um, on this issue. So that's my pitch for JFI. I really hope you go and sign up. Um, uh, it would be great, I think, to have everybody kind of participate to the degree they can. So some of our work, as I mentioned, is framed by the Catholic social teaching principles on migration. And, and there's three really core principles that I'd like to talk about today. One is this idea of um, everybody has the right to uh, be free of persecution and seek a decent well-being life for themselves and their family. Uh, we describe this one basically as, as the right to migrate, the right that you have the ability, if, if you are in a situation where you cannot escape a, a terrible situation, you cannot provide for your family, you have the right to migrate. But equally important and a counterbalance is everyone has the right to stay where they are in their country of origin or where they are in this moment um, and try and achieve that, that goal too, of having a, a decent life and, and decent work and, and opportunity for themselves and their families. And that we call for short term the right not to migrate. And the other principle, the other two principles that I think are really important when we think about this discussion is um, you know, the bishops and Catholic social doctrine uh, recognize the right of nations to control their borders. They recognize the right of nations to control their borders. But that right comes with a responsibility. And that responsibility is to ensure that laws are just and humanely implemented, that they respect the right of the of the U.S. taxpayer, they also respect the right of and human decency and dignity of, of individuals. And so, you know, these are some of the principles that we work with. The last I will say to you is um, refugees and asylum seekers, people who are fleeing persecution, have the right to access due process and protection. Um, it's part of who we are as a country, but also recognizing vulnerabilities. So these are the principles that we try to implement when we look at pieces of legislation or policy advancement um, with Congress and with the Hill. I would say to you that there have been a number of changes on the policy level um, that have impacted actually your community or will be impacting your community uh, that 
really are in conflict with some of those principles. Um, the first I'm going to mention is DACA. How many people here know what DACA is? Okay. So we have approximately seven to 800,000 young people who applied for a program uh, that was initiated in 2012 under uh, President Obama. It is a program where these individuals pay um, every two years. They move forward uh, with a security vetting process. And they're allowed to get a work authorization and continue living here even though they've been here undocumented. DACA is not a program that ever provides someone with a path to citizenship. That means that these individuals, they're here on a temporary basis based on that DACA, that deferred action that the government has issued. Now, everybody raised their hand about DACA. Who knows a DACA uh, recipient actually face to face? So many of you who know, who raised your hand, know that this is a really exceptional group of people. They're young people, they were brought here by their parents, and, and they really do look to contribute. Um, obviously, you know, I think the issue of canceling DACA, uh, the, the attempt by the administration, was very troubling, I think, for the bishops for a number of reasons, um, and it is something that we work on. One, I would say um, this idea of, of, again, right to opportunity and, and right to, to be able to try and, and live a decent life. Um, these were young people who were being stymied very much in the sense that they couldn't go to college or they couldn't get a driver's license or they couldn't work legally, which is all things that we want young people to be able to do, right? Have the chance to access educational opportunity, have the chance to, to drive legally with insurance, and have the chance also uh, to work in a legal way. Um, I think the other thing that, you know, the politics of DACA aside, for the bishops and many of these policies, they spend time with DACA recipients in their community. And they you know, had DACA recipients who came up to them and said, I, I, this program has changed my life. Um, this is something that's important to us. So you know, the DACA program, we remain committed uh, to being supportive of ensuring that these young people have the chance to stay here and contribute. But I will say that it's important to understand that DACA itself is no fix. Uh, we do need Congress to act on this, and we need Congress to act on a number of things, um, including the next topic I'm going to bring up, which is temporary protected status. Who here knows what temporary protected status is? Okay. TPS, for those of you that don't know, is a program that was initiated under um, President Bush in 1989 with bipartisan support that allowed people, it's a, a law uh, that Congress passed that allows people who are from countries who have extreme either armed conflict or natural disasters stay here in a temporary uh, status. It provided that they check in with the government um, about every 18 months. They pay a fee, they do a security check, and they also get work authorization. This, uh, with the new administration, we've seen a cut to the temporary protected status issue. Now, what does that mean? Who are TPS recipients? Well, you are in a community uh, with a number of TPS recipients. Uh, you have one of the top 50 congressional districts with TPS recipients from El Salvador. Uh, you may not even know that they are in your community because they have been here for so long. Um, the Salvadoran TPS recipients, they uh, started living here in 2001 to be able to be eligible for the program. Um, many people, I think, I don't know if you know, but the Salvadoran bishops came and actually were invited to speak uh, with Bishop Burbage at the cathedral. Did anybody go to that? Okay, so they came and the, and the bishops themselves answered questions about this program. And there were questions about what happens now that this program has been canceled. What are we going to do about this issue? Um, you know, I face a lot of lawmakers that say, well, this was a temporary program and people shouldn't live their lives here. But I would like to say and, and give an example of somebody who um, we met uh, when we worked on this issue and the bishops came. It's a woman who com comes from St. Camillo's uh, Parish in Silver Spring. Her name is Floor. Uh, she's lived here since 2002, and she has four U.S. citizen children. She's a TPS recipient, 
She's a school aide. She works here legally because she has TPS, and she teaches catechesis at St. Camilla's. Uh, Floor is facing a decision of whether she should um, return to El Salvador when her TPS ends, which is in September of 2020, or uh, 2019, or whether she should face family separation because she wants to be in compliance with our immigration laws, but the way that we have ended the program, she has no remedy uh, to ensure that her family can stay together. So this is the type of change that when we, we talk about policies abstractly and we talk about uh, you know, this administration or this Congress or that president, uh, we need to always remember the human consequences of, of this work. Um, and so, you know, it's our work, it's our job, I think, frankly, to articulate those policies, uh, remind lawmakers about those principles, and engage on, on those issues. Um, I would say that I'm, I'm really hopeful as we have a discussion and kind of as we move forward uh, that you think about kind of uh, your own encounter. You know, it may not be... Um, speaking to a lawmaker. It may be uh, learning more about TPS recipients in your community. Uh, it may be understanding and learning more in your parish about other immigrants and refugees that live here. Uh, but it is a call and I think a moment um, we as Catholics have a responsibility to learn more. Uh, you know, Pope Francis calls us to encounter others, but also to accompany those who are in pain, regardless of because of their immigration status or, or some other thing. So I'm really hopeful uh, that you will check out JFI, and um, I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. And next up is Jeff Caruso, the Executive Director of the Virginia Catholic Conference. Thank you. The um, Virginia Catholic Conference, as many of you know, is the public policy office of Virginia's Catholic bishops in their two dioceses, uh, with the two dioceses, of course, being the Diocese of Arlington and the Diocese of Richmond. Um, you know, a lot of the work that state Catholic conferences do um, uh, is, of course, you know, the bulk of the work is at the state level uh, where we work at the Virginia General Assembly. Um, we also uh, provide a supportive role to the uh, U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops on uh, federal issues. Um, and in all of our work, the, the state level work and the federal work, um, our mission is, is really grounded in the U.S. bishops um, forming consciences for faithful citizenship document, which um, I encourage you to, to read the whole thing um, if you have uh, uh, time to do so. But I, uh, uh, this evening, I just want to read two really short uh, excerpts from it uh, that, that have uh, uh, particular relevance to this topic. Um, the, the first is, is under their section on solidarity, and it says, We are one human family, whatever our national, racial, whatever our national, racial, ethnic, economic, and ideological differences. And then later on in that section, uh, it says, Solidarity also includes the scriptural call to welcome the stranger among us, including immigrants seeking work, by ensuring that they have opportunities for a safe home, education for their children, and a decent life for their families, and by ending the practice of separating families through deportation. Uh, and then later on, there's a, a section specifically on migration, and, and I just want to read that to you, because that, that really, uh, from that really kind of flow, the work that we do at the state level really flows from that. Uh, for migration, here's what the U.S. bishops say in Faithful Citizenship. The gospel mandate to welcome the stranger requires Catholics to care for and stand with newcomers, authorized and unauthorized, including unaccompanied immigrant children, refugees and asylum seekers, those unnecessarily detained, and victims of human trafficking. Comprehensive reform is urgently necessary to fix a broken immigration system and should include a broad and fair legalization program with a path to citizenship, a work program with worker protections and just wages, family reunification policies, access to legal protections, which include due process procedures, refuge for those fleeing persecution and violence, and policies to address the root causes of migration, 
The right and responsibility of nations to control their borders and to maintain the rule of law should be recognized, but pursued in a just and humane manner. The detention of immigrants should be used to protect public safety and not for purposes of deterrence or punishment. Alternatives to detention, including community-based programs, should be emphasized. So how do we take the, the Catholic social teaching and the work at the federal level and uh, this material from Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship and how do we apply that to our state level here in Virginia? Well, during the 2018 Virginia General Assembly session, uh, the Virginia Catholic Conference worked on three primary areas relating to uh, immigrants. And those areas were education, transportation, and safety. And we anticipate that those same areas are going to come up again during the 2019 session. Um, so just to kind of uh, briefly encapsulate those, those three areas of, of our work. Uh, when, when education, uh, the Virginia Attorney General uh, ha issued a number of years ago an advisory opinion. And that advisory opinion states that um, dreamers can access in-state tuition uh, if they hold DACA status. So uh, one of the things we sought to do um, during the 2018 session as well as in previous ones uh, was to support a bill to try to codify that Attorney General's opinion uh, into our state statutory law. And uh, that bill did not pass, um, but uh, we expect it to come back up in 2019 and we'll be uh, supporting that again. Um, more broadly for DREAMers, we also supported a, another bill that, that would go a little bit further, and that would, would grant in-state tuition for uh, any student who um, met the following three conditions. One, uh, they attended uh, high school in Virginia th for three or more years. Uh, secondly, either they or their parents have paid income taxes for three or more years. And third, um, they have applied for permanent residency. So um, again, dreamers, when we're talking about dreamers, we're talking about uh, children uh, that came to the, the country uh, at a young age uh, and they're uh, seeking uh, an, an education in, in this country, um, uh, which by our, our Catholic social teaching, we have a, a right to uh, a decent education uh, for, for our um, human uh, fulfillment and flourishing. Um, so those are the two areas for education. For, for transportation, uh, our, our goal is, is that we certainly want those uh, in immigrant communities to be able to safely attend church, work, and school. And to um, be able to accomplish that, uh, one of the bills that we supported during the 2018 session was a bill that would provide uh, a temporary one-year driving permit regardless of, of immigration status uh, if the, the person uh, could meet three conditions. One, of course, they would need to pass a, a driver's test, and this would also promote public safety. Um, second, they would have to prove that they have paid state taxes, and third, they would have to pay an application fee. Um, so again, this would further these, these interests of, of, of safety. Uh, and, and being able to, to attend um, vital functions like being able to, to attend church, work, and school. The safety component also uh, bore itself out in, in a, a third area that we worked on, uh, and that was a bill that we supported uh, that would ensure that victims of crime and witnesses to crime uh, could come forward and not be asked about their immigration status during an investigation of those crimes. Um, this would, of course, in, encourage people to, to uh, uh, share their, their experiences about these crimes and, and to, to have these vital uh, investigations take place. Um, the converse of that is we also oppose legislation that, that would have discouraged people from coming forward um, by not allowing localities to have these, these types of policies. Um, so those are, are, are the three areas, and again, we, we expect them to, um, uh, uh, none of these bills um, that we supported passed, um, but we are gonna continue to support them, and we hope to continue to make some progress in, in these debates. 
Um, I'll finish by um, asking or encouraging people to uh, go to our website, which is www.vacatholic.org. Uh, how many people are a member of the Virginia Catholic Conference email advocacy network? Okay, that's a, a start. Um, uh, hopefully by the end of the evening, it can be a larger number. Um, we would, uh, I would encourage you, uh, even on your phone right now, if you're able, uh, uh, go to our website and there's a sign up feature. Uh, and uh, if you would sign up for our email network, you'll get um, alerts uh, on issues before bills are voted upon and also uh, regular um, updates on um, issues relating to immigration as well as um, many other issues uh, that relate to Catholic social teaching. Uh, so I want to uh, thank you for your, um, your time this evening and, um, uh, and, and also encourage you in addition to signing up for the, the Virginia Catholic Conference Network, just another plug to sign up for the um, JFI uh, alerts too. I, I receive those and it's very helpful to the, the work of the state Catholic conferences. So that's uh, justiceforimmigrants.org. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And last but certainly not least, Gregory McKinney, who is the Associate Director at Migration and Refugee Services of Catholic Charities of the Diocese of Arlington. Good evening. I'm going to depart from my prepared remarks to some extent, so I apologize to you from the outset. <laughs> um, the, I'd like to really thank the panelists. I'd like to thank Father Edelson. Uh, St. Agnes is a great partner with the work that the local office of Migration and Refugee Services does. So we are a sub-office or subcontractor of the USCCB um, Office of Migration and Refugee Services. And on the mission statement of the USCCB Migration and Refugee Service, it says our commitment is rooted in the gospel mandate that every person is to be welcomed by the disciple as if he or she were Christ himself. So Ashley and Jeff are inviting you to engage with the politics and the policy and participate with that. Jeff doesn't send too many emails. I'd, I'd encourage you to sign up for the, for, for the VCC email. We are the people that um, meet the stranger at the airport and help them set up their household and enroll their kids in school and get their social security card. So we work with very specific populations. And when you hear the word refugee in the context of the, in the American context, these are people that have been vetted for multiple times, multiple interviews for an 18 to 36 month period overseas before they are allowed to come into this country. Um, so the refugee is someone that has crossed an international border and can no longer go back home. And they have, um, they go back home in fear of their lives and they have crossed a border fleeing persecution on the basis of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. So if they meet the legal definition of a refugee and, and pass, I'm doing dangerous oversimplification, um, come into the country through the system, that's a refugee. We also work with asylees, people that have, are in this country claiming the same standard, I can't go back home because of persecution under those five terms and I want to stay here. So if their petition is approved, either by a USCIS administrative official or most often an immigration judge after about a two year period for many of them, they can come and receive services. They have a status that we can work with. We also work with, um, and this has been the bulk of our clients for the last, uh, since 2014. Um, people that come into the country with what's termed a special immigrant visa, an SIV. And those are Afghans and Iraqis that worked with our troops overseas. They were combat translators out under fire, or they were embassy drivers or security in the embassy, or they were engineers building roads and bridges and rural development projects. And because they were collaborators with the US or coalition forces, 
Uh, they, the Afghan government had, doesn't have a problem with them, but the bad actors in their neighborhoods do. And even though they were working with our forces overseas, they also have to have a vetting process that usually on average takes about 30 months while they're looking over their shoulder wondering if the person, somebody's gonna come after them. We've actually had clients that in the waiting period have lost a family member before they got here. So those are the groups that we work with and a couple other temporary, a couple other protected statuses. So, and there are th uh, two other agencies I'll just mention quickly. Lutheran Social Services has an office in the, in the Northern Virginia area and uh, the uh, Ethiopian Community Development Council. There are nine national agencies that do this work across the country and Catholic Charities is the largest. Uh, at our agency, we have people, our staff is multinational. We speak many languages, many different faiths, but we all work to the standards of human dignity and solidarity that Father Ed Wilson discussed. And we also work with two things that are kind of underpinning all of this too, one of which is hospitality. Uh, hospitality is very ancient. There's six specific references in the Old Testament to loving the alien that lives among you because you yourself, Israelites, were aliens in the land of Egypt once upon a time. Treat the aliens among you better than you were treated. Um, and the other one is accompaniment. And that's a, really uh, called out through uh, the, 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 the ethic of the Jesuits that you go with the person that you're trying to assist, not to tell them what to do and not to hold it, not to, well, excuse me, not to hold their hand, not to pull them along, but to go along with them. So that's the ethic that we work under with our clients. Uh, all of the U.S. resettlement agencies have a goal of self-sufficiency through early employment. So when they arrive, one of the first things we do is, is enroll them in one of our two employment services. We help them find jobs. We assess their educational backgrounds. We can't help anybody get a college education, but we can send them to get a computer course, for instance. Uh, integration, not assimilation, integration into their community so that they understand the country they're living in. And we're in a position, y'all are in a position to understand the the cultural aspects, the cultural differences. And none of this works unless it's a public-private partnership. And I can speak for the three agencies in Northern Virginia, the best examples of public-private partnerships that you could hope to see, government, nonprofit, and the community working together. So the we meet the stranger at the airport um, when they come in, we've got someone there to greet them. Sometimes people from the parishes come along with us to greet them. Uh, there's got to be someone in the state of Virginia that they have to have a connection with. In, in Northern Virginia, that is an immediate family member, other parts of the state. It could be somebody that knew you overseas, but those people have to step up before they're allowed to come and live in Virginia. We, um, we'll help them set up a household. We use donations from the parishes. Uh, everybody gets new bedding. Most people get new pots and pans. They might get a used dresser or a used couch, but we give them as nice of things, again, because of that human dignity and also made possible by the generosity of the parishes. So there's a 90-day period that uh, the State Department contracts with these organizations, the reception and placement period that gets them settled. And then the federal government also provides money to the Virginia Office of Newcomer Services for, let's call them accompaniment services, because we can move along with those clients for five years. What's five years? That's when you become a citizen, right? So we can help them try to get back in their professional fields. We have a lot of, uh, and we have engineers and lawyers and doctors and nurses and pharmacists and everything that, uh, even a judge, uh, as clients have come in as one of the SIVs, we help to orient them to the health insurance system. We have a diaper program. Our clients can come get diapers every month and we get, when they have a new baby, we give them a new, ba new, new diaper bait, all provided by donations. Uh, we have specialists that help them um, with school enrichment, SAT prep, college prep, uh, field trips, uh, STEM workshops. Uh, we had a soccer picnic about two months ago and that was a blast, everyone loves that. 
We have uh, a case worker for uh, age 60, uh, folks over age 60 that have a little bit more trouble, you know, they don't know the language and, and they're, you know, so pulled away from their cultural background, a little more holistic case management. We go out into the community every two months across Northern Virginia and have meetings that you can go and meet people from the school board, uh, police department, uh, health department, uh, other churches, uh, community organizations that are interested in helping support the refugee clients. So I want to give you just a few numbers about, the, about sort of the volume and the things that we do for work. So this is just talking about my office now and in the national picture. So over the past four fiscal years, we're on the federal fiscal year, our office has averaged resettling per fiscal year 650 individuals. And that's been anywhere from like 24 to 26 countries. So we're 11 months into the current fiscal year and our number is 270 individuals representing six countries. Most actually 90%, usually about 60, 70% were the uh, Afghan and Iraqi SIVs in previous years. It's 90%, almost 90% this year. Um, but 656 to 270 right now, and Lutheran Social Services, about the same size organization, they're in the same numbers. Nationally, since 1975, the average annual U.S. admissions was 77,525. For fiscal year 17, this fiscal year, the presidential determination for admissions was set at 45,000 individuals. 11 months in, nationally, we are at 19,900 admissions. Now that's the refugee that crossed the international border, okay? Let's talk real quickly about the SIVs, the ones that worked with our troops, um, they actually received more open slots in December 2017, 3,500 more slots. They're not part of that 45,000 refugee number. There are thousands of Iraqis and even more Afghans that are still in the pipeline to be processed, still have made the application, still there, still going through the vetting screening process. The first six months of this fiscal year, 7,900 individuals with the SIV visa, family principals and family members were admitted. In this last six months of the fiscal year, with two weeks remaining, only 1,969 have been admitted. Processing has currently ground to pretty much a near halt. So the majority of the clients that we've been serving since 2014, the SIVs, who I think should actually come in with some types of veterans preference, um, they're currently just a trickle. So we still have lots of people in our books, all the people from the years past. Love to talk to you about volunteers. I'm not going to take any more time. Perhaps we'll have some more time to dig into some of these other things afterward. Thank you. Thank you, Gregory. And because I work with Gregory, I'd just like to also mention the importance of the integration piece that he was mentioning, that we don't just, you know, pick them up at the airport and say, okay, you know, we're done here. Thank you so much. Good luck. Um, we really do accompany them, and we do that for five years. And um, I was just recently crunching data, and um, we employed 91% of arrivals um, this past fiscal year. So these are people that they come here and within the first 90 days, we 91%, we get a job. We get, you know, we help them get a job. So they're not, you know, sitting idle. And it goes back to the whole dignity piece, as well as, you know, the dignity of work um, and of the worker. And then in addition, um, we all, all are, are refugee children, 99%, I think, <laughs> Belina, you can correct me, um, moved up a grade level this past year. So they are integrating in the schools and all 100% of the graduating high school seniors are going on to college. 
So these are things that um, are just, you know, important kind of local um, stories to, to comment on, that these are not, this is not some subgroup um, of individuals because we are able and we have the support from parishes and the community to really support and accompany um, the, the um, individuals when they arrive here. So if you do have questions, please bring me your index cards and we're going to try to get through as many of them as possible before the end of the, of, uh, the evening. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask one then that is more catered towards Ashley sure. she has to leave here. Are any unaccompanied minors from the U.S.-Mexico border in Virginia? And if so, does the Catholic Church help them? Um, yes, there are. Um... Thank you. Yes, there are unaccompanied minors here in Virginia. Um, and we do have Catholic Charities who are assisting them. Um, what they are providing are basically uh, family reunification. They're doing child welfare checks to ensure that these kids are, are safe and not trafficking victims, ensuring that they can reunify with a parent or a sponsor because that's a more effective use of resources. Um, and then they're also being given um, information about how to enroll in school and how to comply with their immigration proceedings. Um, and I, you know, I, uh, there's some here in this community, there's some also in, in Richmond, and then there's a number of shelters that are operated throughout uh, Virginia of children who have not been released uh, to family or approved sponsors. And I will just add um, on that because I oversee OGAR Immigrant Services, which is one of the programs of Catholic Charities. We do have um, seven bilingual immigration attorneys, and we are helping unaccompanied minors um, in our diocese. Uh, Virginia is the seventh largest state nationwide that is a receiver of, uh, a recipient state for these uh, children that are being released from detention, and then they are put in deportation proceedings. Um, we have clients that are two years old. Uh, that were brought here on the back of, you know, on the Toxa trains by their, you know, nine-year-old brother, for example, um, fleeing gang violence, um, things like that. And so we are doing our best to to at least help them through the crazy immigration legal process, especially since they don't even speak the language and they are not afforded a public defender um, because they are um, undocumented. Um, sorry for the brevity of the answers, but um, I, I'm happy to stay after and, and, you know, answer any other questions if you have about that. Um, where does the law regarding illegal immigration, uh, which countries need to preserve the life of all and to keep order safety, intersect or come into play with Catholic teachings? Does anyone want to take a stab at that one? So I guess, uh, what's the Catholic teaching response to um, the countries need to preserve life and keep order and safety? give a quick policy and sure. then I will defer to, to Father. I'm going to give a quick policy of what we're doing and I'll defer to, uh, to Father. Um, I think that all countries have that responsibility and we work really hard to ensure um, that some of these countries who have been traditionally sending countries um, are doing better in terms of um, following the law, being places where people can raise families, uh, really being places that are transparent with better judiciaries and police systems. That's part of the root causes when we talk about the need to stop migration, irregular migration. Um, part of that is looking at why are people leaving. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why it, it, many of you I'm sure are familiar with the work of Catholic Relief Services. They do a lot of work in some of the, the countries that are sending um, individuals here who people are fleeing from. So one of the things that we always think about when we look at immigration policy development is looking at the root causes and looking to ensure that we can stabilize and secure some of these countries uh, so there are better opportunities, there are more safe places for people to stay and they don't feel the need to migrate. Um, and so I can, you know, Turn it over to Father, I think, on some of the, the social teaching. Okay, it looks like, I guess if I'm understanding the, the question correctly here, it, like there's a, uh, it's talking about a distinction between um, the need to preserve life of all and versus, or 
to keep order and safety. First of all, keeping order and safety in a society is always an issue. I mean, in all human societies, everybody has every law, every society has laws to keep order and safety uh, in one way or the other. And so, whether they're dealing with uh, undocumented or quote illegals or or citizens, um, it's, it's, this is an issue that is always at stake, uh, in, always at stake in, in, in civil governance. Um, it's you know the duty of part of the common good to do, you know to provide the peace, the law, and the order by which all peoples can thrive and fulfill their, you know, their, their purposes and, and goodness in life, both as individuals, as families, and groups. Uh, but at the same time, the, uh, the right to life is also you know, something that all societies have an obligation to protect as well. So and then we, when you start looking at all of these issues in particular, this is where you, know, this is where you do, yes, you once get into the prudential aspects of them, but at the same time, that they're not strictly prudential because we still have to maintain and respect the dignity of the human person. Uh, so I, I, I'm sorry, I'm answering that rather abstractly because you're, the question entails a, a multiplicity of issues, uh, not just integration. Uh, but that said, I mean, yes, the law and order is part of the common good, but at the same time, we have to remember what is the law and the order supposed to serve? It's supposed to serve the development of the human person uh, irrespective of who they are. So. Thank you, Mary. Uh, the next question. Um, the SIVs, the Special Immigrant Visa Holders that Gregory was mentioning um, from Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, what is the reason for the slowdown in having them come to the U.S.? All I can suggest is um, there has been a reassignment of personnel overseas, they, they call them circuit riders. So the ones that would go into the urban centers or into the refugee camps and do the interviews, the vetting interviews, they have reassigned a significant percentage of those from overseas assignments to stateside assignments. I've heard anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of the overseas staff. I, I don't know what the number is, but a, a large portion. They've been reassigned to this country to handle the backlog of asylum cases. So there are going, and there's some new administrative judges that have been appointed. Hopefully that's going to pick up some momentum and some speed to work through the backlog. But it's not adding any, it's not adding any more personnel to do this. It's just taking from one pot and putting it in another. So maybe the, the processing of the SIVs is just a collateral damage from just not having the staff there to be able to do the processing. If there's another motive behind that, I, I don't know, I'm not going to speculate, so. I'll just add that um, when last year we had over a hundred of the individuals who are the refugee core officers who do the interviewing, um, and at some point this summer, we know that there were approximately 60 uh, refugee corps officers, and they're not making the normal uh, uh, circuit rides to some of the places where traditionally we have processed the SIVs before. So um, it is, I think, a reorganizing of how the administration is choosing to uh, kind of look at the processes that they're resettling refugees. But um, you know, it's certainly a reduction in the capacity to assist um, refugees and SIVs just uniformly across the board. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions about that I'm seeing, and I'm kind of trying to sum them all up about sanctuary cities. I did want to be able to at least respond to those questions that are out there. Um, one of them is, what is the official policy regarding sanctuary cities and its impact and its impact upon safety of all citizens? I don't know if anyone wants to take a stab at that. Sure. So I, I just want to be real clear. Um, so sanctuary cities are relating to the law enforcement um, administration of a city and its choice to whether to engage with ICE, um, which is Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which is an office of the Department of Homeland Security. Um, cities uh, can make the choice of whether they want to engage with the Department of Homeland Security in, in what's known as a, a detainer request. If you pick someone up, 
um, and you run through you know, all of their vitals, you find out that they're undocumented. Um, the municipality, as the law is written right now, has the right to choose whether they're going to turn that person over to ICE or whether they are not. Um, it may seem like a simple question of safety, but I do want to back up to Father's point about subsidiarity. Um, we traditionally have had the federal government do the enforcement of immigration law. We have had local and state law enforcement do the work of local and state law enforcement and community policing. Um, and the reason for that uh, divide over the years has been about community trust and it's also been about local prerogative. Um, we see in certain instances that uh, you know, there's jurisdictions that make a variety of choices on this. Again, local communities have to choose whether they want to work with the Department of Homeland Security or whether they don't. Uh, but the official position here, I think, is to recognize the right of the local government on this and, and see that they are um, you know, making the decision as, as the local kind of authority. Uh, one of the things I think we do, uh, the bishops are concerned about having worked with a lot of immigrants, um, particularly trafficking victims, um, sometimes we see also U visas, so crime victims, is that when we have seen in our work, sometimes when law enforcement is deputized to do federal immigration enforcement work, you do see people who are less willing to come forward and work with law enforcement. You do see less engagement in immigration communities. Um, it is a fact that you know, certain communities have seen decreased reporting on domestic violence uh, and other crimes um, on this issue. But sanctuary cities have nothing to do uh, with the church giving sanctuary, that's a different issue of sanctuary, and it has nothing to do with local municipalities issuing benefits like access to hospital or healthcare or other things. It is an, a simple exchange with law enforcement, whether law enforcement will make the choice to work with the federal government on immigration enforcement or not. Um, the U.S. Catholic community has been very quiet about the plight of the Middle Eastern Catholics Greek Catholics, Coptic, and Orthodox Christians. We don't seem to be active in helping them, especially those facing, facing excuse me, death and persecution. Anyone wanna? <laughs> it's not really a question, it's a statement, but I, I love to know if you wanna to respond to those that statement. Um, so uh, the USCCB, along with Catholic Relief Services um, and other Catholic partners like Catholic Charities USA, has been doing uh, work on religious minority refugees who have not been admitted. Um, like the other refugee populations that we've seen a real decrease of admittances, religious minorities, including Christians, and Chaldean Christians in particular, have seen a real uh, decline in their admittance as well. Um, this issue has been brought up with Secretary Pompeo and is particularly, I think, on the mind of the bishops right now because we're in the period of working on the presidential determination, which is the number, as Greg mentioned, that'll determine the kind of uh, ceiling of refugees for the year, for the next year. I urge you, um, whoever wrote the question, I'm happy to follow up, but I urge you also to mention this to your lawmaker because uh, Congress, you know, I think it's a Representative Comstock, has oversight capacity on this. And Meyer. We, Meyer. Oh. Don Meyer. Don Meyer. I'm sorry, I thought it was Robert Comstock, but um, has, has a capacity to do oversight on this issue, and we are trying to work with lawmakers to heighten awareness on this and make sure that the State Department considers. So if you're interested, follow up with me, and I, I'm happy to help draft some points for you. I actually commune with the Melkite Greek Catholics, so that's uh, Syrian, Lebanese, uh, the uh, eparchy of uh, Synods in Damascus. Uh, the uh, Melkite Senate is very interested in rebuilding the Christian communities there and not having the people leave and creating conditions within uh, Syria and uh, especially that they can return home. So uh, I, the, the Knights of Columbus uh, in, your, in your parishes, uh, they are actually very active. Not only, it, it's different because they can opt to be included or not, but the Knights of Columbus actually has a, a support program for Christians in the Middle East 
Also, the Catholic Near East Welfare Association, C-N-E-W-A. Uh, check their website out, uh, and you could make a donation or be an advocate there to uh, help preserve that Christian community in the, uh, in the, the Near East. And also, uh, Orthodox Christian, uh, International Orthodox Christian Charities, IOCC, is also very active among all Christians and Palestinians and the Arab and Christian communities there. So those are three good organizations that you could look to to get some more information and to help keep the Christian Christian presence in the Holy Land. All right, we have time for one more question. Um, what are the biggest pushbacks you hear from lawmakers when trying to move forward policy infused with Catholic social teaching? I can take that one. Yeah. I figured I'll, I'll give it to Jeff. <laughs> Go for it, Jeff. <laughs> well, I, I think it's um, probably what I hear the most is is what I would call the the either or versus the both and approach. So, um, you know, the with all all the focus being on enforcement and categorizing somebody as you know, legal or illegal, documented or undocumented. Um, whereas I, I think kind of a, you know, a more global, comprehensive approach would be helpful where we, we start with the, the dignity of the human person uh, and, then, and then through that lens we look at the whole range of issues. We look at enforcement, certainly. Um, we also look, look at um, what's consonant with dignity and um, what's uh, in, best in terms of furtherance of public safety, in terms of education, uh, in terms of the, the future of our commonwealth and, and the future of our country. Um, so I, I think we can, we can look at, at all of these things and sort of, of multitask, if you will, instead of, of, of just saying, well, it's, it's either this or that. I just want to address another question that uh, has come up a little bit, also has come up a few times, you know, in face-to-face with some Christians. They'll say, Father, the minute you take them in your rectory, I'll take them in my own. Or, or same with the bishop. I'm gonna say, let me address that. Okay. Uh, first of all, what we're asking people to do in the church really is to help them get settled in their home. And this is how we work through MRS, Migration Refugee Services, and get settled in their home in their neighborhoods. Um, and so, for example, I remember when I was at the University of Mary Washington, uh, I worked closely with the MRS. I see Laurel Collins is here, and we, we worked with her. And uh, you know what we did is, for example, we played soccer. We had the college students play soccer with a lot of the uh, more high school age students to help them feel at home in the neighborhood, to help them feel welcome into the Fredericksburg area when I was at University of Mary Washington's chapel. And you know it was taken, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, but a good number of those kids that were there were had grown up in um, they were Bhutanese from Bhutan, but had were the victims of an ethnic cleansing. And had grown up in a uh, in a refugee camp in Nepal, which is, explains why they were very good at soccer. So much else to do in the, in the I guess in the, the camps. But that said, you know they're finally coming to a place where they can settle into a neighborhood, into a land, a town, and have their own home and their space. And this is what we're seeking to do. Now, if you wish to have somebody settle in your home, I would advise that you go to an agency that can help you with that, because that is a very particular. Uh, way of welcoming someone, but it's a very, it's a very particular way. It's not the usual way, um, and of course, if you're careful with that, because there's a lot of factors that have to be considered in, in 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 doing something like that. But that said, I think the important thing here is the thrust of what we do here at St. Agnes with MRS, as our aim is to help those who are trying to settle in their own home, to buy them their, like like uh, Greg was saying, mat their mattresses or their, their forks and knives or help them. You know, you know, get taking the job interviews, or you know, how to how to enroll in the school system, etc. So, this is the aspect that we can help with here, uh, according to our um, you know our abilities and so forth. So anyway, I would like to conclude here uh, with a prayer. Um, I also like to always invoke the the word of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. When they had departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream 
and said, Rise and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. And stay there until I tell you. Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. Joseph, Joseph rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. Heavenly Father, help us to look upon the world with the eyes of your Son. That we may look upon the world with the grace you gave us at our baptism, which is more profound and eternally abiding than our citizenship to any nation, to any nation of earth. Help us to recognize that we're all destined to be citizens of the new heaven and the new earth, the heavenly city, where all tears shall be wiped away and only joy and peace alike. We ask this to you, Heavenly Father, through the prayers of the mother of your divine Son. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all for coming out. Have a blessed evening.